So good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Happy Nurses Week. (laughs) And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Bernadette Melnick, here to the UW-Madison School of Nursing to kick off Nurses Week. She joins us from the Ohio State University, where she is the dean of its College of Nursing and serves as vice president for health promotion and chief wellness officer. For the past two decades, Byrne has championed the evidence-based practice movement across the United States. And it was in this role where she and I first met. I don't know if you remember this. Um, Where she facilitated an all day workshop for the nursing faculty and our practice partners when I was at Grand Valley State University. And it was right about the time when I think your first book on evidence-based practice that you and Ellen did came out. Since that time, Byrne has consulted with hundreds of healthcare systems and academic institutions around the world on how to improve healthcare quality and population health outcomes through evidence-based practice. Her record as a principal investigator includes over $33 million of sponsored funding from federal agencies and foundations. She is the editor of five books and over 315 publications. As a result, Byrne is recognized for both both nationally and internationally for her expertise and and her, sorry, try that again, for her expertise overall and her research in evidence-based practice, intervention research, child and adolescent health, mental health, and health and wellness overall. She has an impressive portfolio that also includes fellowship in the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Nursing, the National Academy of Practice, and the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, as well as numerous national and international awards. As founder of the National Interprofessional Education and Practice Collaborative, Mel Byrne has advanced the Department of Health and Human Services Million Hearts initiative to prevent one million heart attacks and strokes by 2017, which now has more than 150 participating academic institutions and organizations throughout the United States. She has also created and chaired the first three national summits on building healthy academic communities and founded the National Consortium for Building Healthy Academic Communities, a collaborative organization to improve population health in the nation's institutions of higher learning, for which she served as the first president. Her more recent research explored the relationship between nurses' health, wellness, and errors. We look forward to learning strategies that can maximize health and well-being for nurses and others. So please join me in welcoming Dean Melnick to the podium. Good morning. Happy Nurses Week. How many of you are excited about getting a little bit healthier? Even if you're not excited, could you please act excited for me? (laughs) Because when we act excited, pretty soon we feel excited. And just like stress is contagious, so is enthusiasm. How many of you have tried to change the behavior of somebody you love? We all have, right? Whether it's squeeze the toothpaste differently, put the toilet seat down, get more physically active. But what do we know about behavior change? Is it easy? No, it's what I call character building. Most people don't change behavior unless crisis happens or their emotions are raised. So today, I'm not going to be talking so much about evidence-based practice, but about evidence-based health and well-being, highlighting a national study that we just published. And you could look at this data and say, this is pretty discouraging. (laughs) 
when you see the population health outcomes of nurses that I'm going to show you today. But I look at it through rose-colored glasses. So I say, we have a lot of opportunity for improvement with our own population. So I'm going to first tell you my story because it really captures why I'm so passionate about wellness and prevention. I grew up on the left-hand side of the slide, small little coal mining town in southwestern Pennsylvania, population about a thousand people. My dad was a coal miner. We lived in a half of a little house. The whole thing was probably 900 square feet. Uh, my mom worked off and on as a cook. We were labeled working poor back then, but you know what? I didn't realize that. I was born with rose-colored glasses on, so I can still make lemonade out of lemons any day. And that was a good thing, because on a cold, wintry January morning, when I was 15 years of age, my mom sneezed and stroked out right in front of me and passed. Now you can imagine, 15 years of age, home alone with your mom, and she sneezes and strokes out right in front of you. I suffered from terrible post-traumatic stress. I didn't even know what that was back in the 70s, but I couldn't sleep for months. I'd wake up with nightmares, cold sweats, reliving that sneeze over and over and over again. Well, after a couple of months of not sleeping, not eating well, not doing well in school, a family member took me to my family physician and said, do something to help burn. There was no counseling for me in my little town of Republic, Pennsylvania. So he did what so many providers do still today in 2018. Got out his prescription pad, wrote a script for Valium, said give Burn one of these every night, she'll sleep and be just fine. So I remember taking a Valium that night and I slept for the first time in a few months but I woke up groggy the next morning and I said, you know what? I don't like how I feel. I just gotta gut it up and I gotta get on with it. I have to cope. But in the next four years, not only did I lose my mom suddenly, I lost a cousin uh, after a motor vehicle accident. He died, he was like a brother to me. The year after that, I lost the only grandparent I ever knew and loved. And at 19, my dad had his heart attack. Now that's a lot of grief for an adolescent. But you know the story. What doesn't break us only makes us stronger. And as a result of what I went through, I became passionate to become a nurse then a pediatric nurse practitioner, then a psychiatric mental health NP, and go on to spend almost 30 years of my research career developing and testing evidence-based cognitive behavior therapy programs so we could help children, teens, and college students suffering from anxiety and depression. Now, what was really sad about my mom's story, she had a history of headaches for over a year. And my dad kept saying, would you go to the doctor, figure out what's wrong? She saw her family physician one week before she died. Guess what her diagnosis was? High blood pressure. Given a prescription, for a blood pressure medication, 
that my dad found in her purse after she died. Behaviors, behaviors. How do we get people to change their behaviors, to adhere, to follow through? But again, if I didn't go through what I went through, would I have developed and my evidence-based COPE, CBT program for children, teens, and college students that is now being used in 40 states and providers are getting reimbursed for it. So again, what we experience often shapes our passion for what we end up doing in life. So I wouldn't change that. But how did I get to Ohio State from there, right? Well, Diane Lover and I go back to Rochester, New York. Um, I got my PhD there. And in fact, your beloved Jean Johnson was on my dissertation committee. And let me tell you what, back in those days, Jean was a character builder, and she's still very spunky, uh, Diane says, at the age of 92. But what a fabulous scientist, really. And what she didn't do to teach me to develop a rigorous research career. So I was dean of the College of Nursing and Health Innovation at Arizona State University when Ohio State started calling me. They said, Byrne, we want you to come to Ohio and explode this College of Nursing just like you've done at ASU. And I said, I'm so humbled that you thought of me but I have no intentions of making a lateral move. But I had been investigating corporate wellness for about three years. And you know what astounded me? Corporations were getting it. They were getting the fact that you had to optimize the health and well-being of your employees to decrease healthcare expenditures. So they had been hiring mainly physicians as chief wellness officers for a decade. And my next dream, because I'm always dreaming about what's next, what can I do, who can I help? Um, I had been dreaming about if I were to go somewhere, if I were to leave Arizona State, it would be for my dream job. And what was my dream job then in my head was to spearhead population health and wellness for a big public university. So I threw the dream out there. I said, I'm humbled you thought of me, but I have no intention of making a lateral move. But if I could combine the dean's job with the university-wide leadership role spearheading wellness at your institution, I might talk with you guys. Well, the next thing you know, our president, Gordon Gee, called me and he said, I heard, you, heard what you said to our VP of research. Byrne, this is uncanny. I was just looking at the health care claims for faculty and staff here at Ohio State, and they're not moving in the right direction. So why don't you come in and at least talk with us? Tell us what you think we should do differently to get a better return on what we're investing in health and well-being. Well, I went, I looked at what they were doing. Mainly most universities run health and well-being out of HR. And that was what Ohio State was doing at that time. They had their own health plan. Student life was doing a good job. But everybody was doing stuff in pockets. And it was not fully aligned. 
So I said, that'd be one of the first things I'd do. I'd fully align everybody that's doing anything with health and well-being. And we need to catch an exciting dream. And with that alignment, I bet we could produce better outcomes. So he said, burn your eye. Come, you can be the first chief wellness officer at the Ohio State University. Actually, it was the first chief wellness officer position in the entire country at a university. Now, let me tell you what's happened since then. So since my appointment, other universities have started to appoint chief wellness officers, but they are usually physicians. And I think we are missing a golden opportunity in nursing. There should be a nurse that is CWO at every single university and healthcare system in this country. We go back to wellness and the health promotion to Florence. Who better to focus on wellness and prevention than nurses? But physicians are seeing this in a big way, and they are moving in to these positions all over the country. So I didn't come here to depress you today, but let's take a look where we're at in this country. One out of two people in our country have a chronic condition. One out of two. But what's the saddest piece of this story? 80% of chronic disease is totally preventable with healthy lifestyle behaviors. So I told my students at our convocation, because we graduated this weekend, I said, my charge to you nurse practitioners that are graduating, start writing prescriptions for 30 minutes of physical activity, five days a week, five fruits and vegetables, sleep seven hours a night minimum, stress reduction on a regular basis. Now, I'm not saying medication isn't indicated for people. But what I'm saying is, we got to do a better job of enhancing healthy lifestyle behaviors in our own population, as well as the people for whom we care. Our children, for the first time in our history, are going to have a shorter lifespan than we as parents. So I don't know if you remember. Back in 2012, this Gallup poll study got so much national attention. U.S. physicians set good health example, better than nurses. I'll never forget the day that came out, and I'm saying, oh my goodness, this is awful for the nursing profession. We take great care of everybody else, but we often don't prioritize our own self-care. And in this Gallup poll study, as you can see, look at the percent difference of smokers. Again, we have higher smoking rates than the general population. And that study also showed higher rates of obesity, higher rates of high blood pressure, cholesterol, and higher rates of depression, which were at 14%. I really want you to note that figure in comparison to the recent data that I'm going to show you. So I co-chair a subcommittee at the American Academy of Nursing called Million Hearts. It's under the Health Behavior Expert Panel. So I said to the group, 
Look at this study that was done in 2012. We need a more updated population health study of nurses to see, are we improving or are we backsliding even more? So we put together this national survey, actually over 3,000 nurses across the United States completed this survey, but the data that we published focused solely on practicing nurses. So that's why there were 1790 practicing nurses that we looked at. We're writing a publication now on the entire sample and their healthy lifestyle behaviors. But look at what we found. In this group, about 30% of the nurses had back issues, mus musculoskeletal issues. 27% high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and depression was reported in almost 25% of this sample. That was 11% higher than that Gallup poll study back in 2012. Now, we also looked at how did perceived support of wellness as well as stress in the environment affect these nurses? We showed nurses who believed they had more support for their well-being in their system had better physical and mental health outcomes. Nurses who perceived less stress had better physical and mental health outcomes. But look at this slide. More than 50% of the sample reported poor physical or mental health. Nurses who reported poor physical and mental health were much more likely to make medical errors. And this was a really landmark finding to say, systems, you better start paying more attention to your wellness culture, the health and well-being of your nurses, physicians, and pharmacists. Depression was the leading predictor of medical errors, depression. So we got a lot of national PR visibility from this particular study. I've also contacted JCO, the American Health Associ Hospital Association, about this data because, again, look what we're doing. We found in this study, the longer the shift work, the poorer the health, and the more medical errors. And our study is not the first to show more medical errors with 12-hour shifts. Why don't we stop 12-hour shifts? For a decade, we've known 12-hour shifts are not good for the health of nurses, nor is it good for the quality and safety of our patients, but we continue to do them. I, two years ago, I pulled together all the chief nurses in Columbus, Ohio. I showed them all the data on 12-hour shifts, and I said, when are you going to stop this? And do you know what their response was? Burn. We can't stop this because these nurses love 12-hour shifts. And if we stop them, they're going to jump ship and go to another health care system. And I said, that's why you all have to stop them at once together. Because, again, it gets back to evidence. We know a lot about a lot of things, but it still takes decades for that evidence 
to reach the real world, to improve outcomes. We have to put a sense of urgency on this because it's hurting our patients, it's hurting our nurses. So then we looked at the lifestyle behaviors of the nurses in this study. As you can see, only 17% of the nurses in this sample were getting in the recommended five fruits and vegetables a day. 52, at least, percent of the nurses were getting the recommended at least seven hours of sleep a night. But only 27% were meeting the recommended 150 minutes of physical activity per week. You can see here, past smoking, 21%, only 3% of the sample were active smokers, which was really good. Use of e-cigarettes, about 6.6%. And, but, look at alcohol use quite high. So 13% of the sample said four or more times per week we are having this and then 10% of the population of this sample said we're doing three to four drinks when we do drink. So alcohol use is a growing problem in our population. So we looked at predictors of these healthy lifestyle behaviors. What we found, the higher educated, the more they engaged in physical activity. The longer the shift work, the less they engaged in physical activity. There were health disparities with African-American nurses engaging less in physical activity. And people who were married or in a relationship were more likely to get their 150 minutes of physical activity in a week. That pattern was about the same for every healthy lifestyle behavior that we looked at. So last spring, I went to a couple nursing organizations about five years ago, and I said, we got to do more for our nurses. We have got to do more. We need to focus on this more as a major strategic area for our nurses. People just weren't ready for that. And it's still mind-boggling to me to this day why aren't we more ready for this? Why is it so resisted in our colleges of nursing all throughout the country? I don't understand why the resistance when we should be role modeling healthy lifestyle behaviors, creating cultures of well-being. Well, thank heaven, last year the ANA stepped up and said, we got to do more, this healthy nurse, healthy nation. But not everybody responds to online activities, right? You get about 10 to 15% of people who like incentives, likes challenges online. But you got to build cultures because cultures eat strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can have the best health coach that you want. They could work with a person individually, that person could make progress, but if they go back to a culture that doesn't support well-being, those behaviors are not gonna sustain. So the National Academy of Medicine last year said, we are having a public health epidemic, and that is 
of clinician well-being. Last year, 400 physicians committed suicide. We do not track our numbers in nursing like physicians track theirs. But anecdotal evidence reports nurse suicide is growing too. So last year, NAM said, we've got to launch a major national initiative. And I'm very privileged to serve on this National Action Collaborative for Clinician Wellbeing. We meet in Washington three times a year. We are moving at like speed. But nursing needs to move at light speed in this as well. And why, again, are we letting medicine take front in this whole wellness movement? Well, we've been working hard on this, and I really want to show you that link because all of our students should be familiar with it. All of us nurses should be familiar with it. This is a knowledge hub that we are creating. And I am working with three other physicians right now on an urgent call to action that we hope to publish in a major medical journal for every hospital and healthcare system to hire a chief wellness officer who will really be devoted in improving population health and well being. I'm on the editorial board for American Nurse Today. They're featuring, I'm doing a column, regular column on the nine pillars of wellness. And that's coming out in each of the journals. This is one on emotional wellness, but I try to make it very evidence-based, but very relatable that nurses as well as students can relate to. So if you ask me as a nurse practitioner today, what's the number one cause of death in America? I would tell you technically, it's cardiovascular disease. However, if we take into consideration all causes of death and disease in the United States, it's really behaviors, our number one killer, lack of physical activity, unhealthy eating, smoking. Look at the opioid epidemic we have right now. And this one is infamous, the chair. Beware of the chair. How many of you sit for three hours a day on average? Do you know population health studies show if we do, we're increasing our cardiac risk by 30%. If you sit five on average a day or more, studies show that is comparable to smoking one and a quarter packs of cigarettes on our bodies. Now, everybody, a lot of eyes have wiped when I shared that evidence. But then not everybody, got, not anybody got up and stood, right? Why? It's culture. At Ohio State, I'm so excited. I've put in standing desks all throughout the university. We've got walking treadmills. We stand for a lot of our meetings. Try that. Next time you go in and have a meeting with your peers, say, let's have a standing meeting today instead of a sitting meeting. In addition to being good for your cardiac health, you'll get through meetings a heck of a lot faster when you stand versus when you sit. I'm serious. I no longer do one hour meetings. Everybody knows. It's 50 minutes, and then we recover. We get up, we move, whatever, if it wasn't. But it's a culture thing. At our university-wide 
senior management council meetings. We stand through most of those meetings. But that, that was a culture shift because you don't feel comfortable in standing because everybody else is sitting. But you got to create a culture where this is the norm. This is the default choice, is that culture. So I don't know where you're at right now with your healthy behaviors, your physical activity, your stress reduction, your healthy eating, but I want you to think about that right now. Think about if you keep doing what you're doing right now, what will the last 10 years of your life look like? What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. That's a powerful clip. We're encouraging our students to play that clip when they interact with their patients, to try and take them from pre-contemplation to at least contemplation, to get ready for behavior change. But behavior change isn't easy. Uh, this is a real fitness facility in the state of California. And you have a choice. Do I take the stairs or do I take the escalator? Go to the gym, work out, right? Well, a group of psychologists studied for a week how many people on average took the steps instead of the escalator, two a day on average. How often do we drive around the parking lot looking for the closest place to park instead of parking further away and saying, I'm gonna get my 10,000 steps in a day. So, you heard my story. I've got really bad cardiac genes. So I could say, you know what? I'm gonna die young anyway of a heart attack or stroke. So why should I bother? I'm gonna eat what I wanna eat. I'm gonna drink, I'm gonna exercise, whatever. But I don't do that. This is a population health study that shows more than our genes, more than social circumstances, more than the health care we receive. It's our behaviors that are going to determine whether we die prematurely or not. And then look at the prevalence of depression and anxiety today in our society. One out of four to five children, teens, college students, adults, have a mental health issue, yet less than 25% get any treatment. And if they get treatment, it's usually pills. It's not evidence-based cognitive behavior therapy, which is shown to be the first line gold standard treatment for mild to moderate depression and anxiety. That's why I developed my COPE CBT program. I took the 12 key concepts from CBT and I manualized them. So I could teach any nurse, social worker, teacher to give that program to children, teens, and college students who are suffering from mild to moderate depression and anxiety. We have a terrible shortage of mental health providers. And if you go to a provider, they may be a lovely counselor, but maybe they don't do CBT when we know that's the gold standard. So a lot of people aren't getting evidence-based treatment. 
And in my program, it's all about teaching people that how you think directly relates to how you feel and how you behave. So if I had to give all of you an evidence-based recipe based on population health studies, what do you got to do to cut your rates of chronic disease by that much? 30 minutes physical activity five days a week, you might say, I have no time, burn. Are you kidding me? I don't have time. I can't balance my work, my life. And I would tell you, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes at the gym sweating your guts out. It can be six, five minute movement, brisk walks, jumping jacks at your desk. Put on the music, dance, move. Sitting is also the biggest zapper of our energy. When you stand, and you move frequently throughout the day, I want you to notice how much more energy that you have. Healthy eating, five fruits and veggies a day. Now the ADA is saying nine, but the average American only eats two, two. So let's go to the next goal. Let's go to three, then four, then five. Alcohol in moderation if you drink. What's moderation? One drink a day if you're a female, two a day if you're a male. And everybody asks me, Bern, how big can that drink be? And I tell everybody, not the size of the alcoholic drinks in Vegas that are like this big. The CDC released this data to say, can you believe only 6% of the people in America do this? Only 6%. We could nearly wipe out chronic disease if we could get everybody in America to just do these. Now, every January 1, what do people do? Most Americans make a New Year's resolution. And then by January 30th, 90% fall off the wagon. You don't have to wait till next January to get back on the train again. Today can be your January 1. So here's the charge from me today. Think about your own healthy lifestyle behaviors today. Write it down. What one thing are you going to get just a little better at? One of those evidence-based strategies that I outlined. Write it down. Put it by your desk. Put it where you brush your teeth every day. It takes 30 days to make or break a new habit. And if you fall off the wagon, so what? Get back on the next day and start again. But... The number one excuse for why people don't get their physical activity in or do other lifestyle behaviors is time. But we all have the same amount of time. It's what we choose to prioritize it that counts the most. These are roughly 28,835 jelly beans. I counted out 500 of them and used those to weigh the rest. In this pile, there's one jelly bean for each day that the average American will live. You might have more beans in your life, or maybe less, but on average, this is the time we have. Here's a single bean. It's your very first day. A special day, but kind of a rough day on everyone involved. Add 364 more and you have the first year of your life. Now, for a sense of scale, here are your first 15 years, 5,475 days, which brings us to the threshold of adulthood. And at that moment, this is the time that we have left. And this is, on average, what we will do with all that time. We will be asleep for a total of 8,477 days. If we're lucky, some of that time we'll be sleeping next to someone we love. 
We will be in the process of eating, drinking, or preparing food for 1,635 days. We'll be at work, hopefully doing something satisfying, for the equivalent of 3,202 of those days. 1,099 days will be spent commuting or traveling from one place to another. Maybe a little bit more if you live in L.A. On average, we will watch television in one form or another for a total of 2,676 days. Household activities, like chores and tending to our pets and shopping, will take another 1,576 days. And we will care for the needs and well-being of others, our friends and family, for 564 days. We'll spend 671 days bathing, grooming, and doing all other bathroom-related activities. And another 720 days will go to community activities, like religious and civic duties, charities, and taking classes. After we remove all those beans, this is what remains. This is the time that we have left. Time for laughing, swimming, making art, going on hikes, text messages, reading, checking Facebook, playing softball, maybe even teaching yourself how to play the guitar. So what are you going to do with this time? How much of it do you think you've already used up? If you only had half of it, what would you do differently? What about half of that? How much time have you already spent worrying? instead of doing something that you love. What if you just had one more day? What are you gonna do today? It's a great clip, just to help you think about what do we prioritize on a daily basis. So we know there's been systematic reviews done on what works. And these are the critical elements but it gets back to a lot of culture. Culture is so imperative, but we all know you don't change culture in a year or even two years. It takes five, seven, 10 years to really change a culture. Leaders, supervisors, and managers are critical. They are so critical. Because even if the top layer of leadership supports this, if an employee has a supervisor that dings them from coming back from a Wellness Wednesday walk, what do you think that's going to do to that person? So you got to tackle this in the grassroots, the manager supervisor level and the leadership level. That's really, really important. Visual triggers, you know, signs that the CDC have, we put them by our elevators. So when people are pressing that elevator button, they're thinking about, should I take the steps instead of go up the elevator? And these are the tactics used by the most successful organizations. You've also got to have metrics. So there's a lot of universities out there, and I'm eager to learn about what you all do here. A lot of universities through HR have a personalized health assessment that people take online and a biometric screen. But that's, then that's about it. You've got to do something with that data and you have to tailor your strategy to improve population health outcomes. And why is everybody doing this? Who's doing it? Because we know through research, if people are happy, healthy, they're gonna be more engaged. They're gonna be more productive. They're gonna miss less work. So it's gonna have a big return on investment. In fact, systematic reviews have been done that show you get about a three to four dollar return on investment for every dollar you invest in wellness. So I'm gonna conclude my talk by just showing you our approach to changing culture and improving health outcomes at Arizona State University. We are serious when we say we're going to be 
the healthiest university, not just in Ohio, the nation, but on the planet. But we're like a city. We have over 65,000 students. We have 46,000 faculty and staff. We have all of these hospitals, primary care clinics. So my charge is burn improve population health outcomes across our city. So we dream big, right? But we also execute, and that's key. Because dreams without execution aren't going to get you the outcomes we need. I used to always say, dream big and then eat, eat one bite of the two-ton chocolate elephant at a time but an artist painted that for me. So now I have a healthier version. So we have a big wellness team. So remember I told you how people were siloed? Not anymore. Now I have pulled everybody together. We have a formal one university health and wellness council at Ohio State. We have leaders from every single entity that has anything to do with health and well-being sitting at the table with one another once a month, strategically planning, executing, and then measuring outcomes. And we adopted the socio-ecological framework that guides what we do at Ohio State. So as you can see, we do evidence-based interventions that are targeted to the individual, the family and social network, the workplace culture, and then we also have policies. We measure outcomes of every single thing we do every single year. So if we don't see improvements happening, we go back to the table to say, what can we do? Our philosophy is in God we trust, but everybody else better bring data to the table. And we live by that philosophy. Culture, again, we have to make it easy. We have to make it fun. I always tell all our leaders at Ohio State, there is no sin to having fun at work. We've got to do more of that. So we have all of these supports occurring throughout the entire university. But the one low-hanging fruit, low-costly program I implemented four years ago that is having profound effect on culture is a program called the Buckeye Wellness Innovator Program. I now have 500 faculty and staff who volunteer about three to four hours a month to work with me and my wellness team creating cultures of well-being. We have them in every hospital, in every college, at every extension campus. And now we're studying the impact of these innovators on outcomes. My goal is a thousand in the next two years. I can't be everywhere. My wellness team can't be everywhere. But if we have grassroots faculty and staff functioning as wellness innovators and leaders, again, we are constantly strengthening that culture. And I use football and star power to raise visibility of wellness at Ohio State. Last year, I got the band to do a pre-game show on heart health. It was terrific. That's me down there on the field with the president promoting wellness. 
So again, you've got to use events like that. We have an audience of 109,000 people in that stadium, and we did million heart screenings that day, prior and after the football game. We also partnered with Johnson & Johnson's Human Performance Institute to offer a program. They call it Corporate Athlete. We call it Health Athlete. I have 10 of us, including myself, that are trained to deliver this energy management program. I've put so far about 70% of our VPs, our deans, our faculty, our staff through this program, and it is having awesome outcomes. How many of you pride yourself on being a multitasker? Okay, I used to. I could drive, read, talk on the phone, sing, all at the same time. And I thought that was a good thing until I went to this course. Multitasking is the enemy of full engagement. Now, I want you to watch this clip. These are four big NFL football players. They were going through this program in Florida at the Human Performance Institute. The psychologist, Jim Lair, who invented this program, said, I'm going to give you a task to complete. Your mission is to run through the Florida woods about a half a mile. There will be a white fence at the end. I want you to touch the white fence and run back. The guys laughed. They said, you've got to be kidding, running a mile through the floor. This is nothing. Do you know what we go through if, as an NFL football athlete? He said, ah, but I'm going to caution you. There may be wild boars that come across your path on this mission. And they laughed. Look what happens when they get close to touching the white fence and the psychologist had somebody in the woods to play a wild boar hog sound. They weren't fully engaged. They were talking, looking around. I mean, they just weren't. So part of this energy management program, it's a two-day course we offer at the university, is to teach people how to engage fully across four enemy energy dimensions. And we also help people to face their true story and rewrite a new one. That's very powerful. Four years ago, I started this program, a wellness onboarding program for all the health sciences students. Within two weeks of coming into Ohio State, the students take a personalized wellness assessment, they do a biometric screen, and then for 12 weeks, they get hooked to a nurse practitioner wellness coach who delivers my CBT uh, program. We're getting amazing outcomes with this, but what I want you to hear, 30 to 40% of incoming students in medical school, dental, vet med, nursing, report elevated depressive symptoms coming in. So if we don't screen, we're not going to catch those students coming in. We've seen nice drops in stress, anxiety, depression in our population, improvement, 7% improvement in cardiovascular health outcomes. And we are in a negative health care spend as a result of our culture. So that's almost unheard of. 
most organizations are in a positive healthcare spend. We have this new national organization, which now we have about 80 universities represented. We have a new summit coming up April 30th and May 1st. I hope some of you guys will attend. So lastly, why do this? Why commit? Commit to yourselves. Commit to your families. I didn't have a mom to see me graduate from high school, college, go on to have my three beautiful daughters, which you see up on the slide. So if you don't do it for yourself, do it for the people who love you, who want to have you around a really long time. Kaylin just got her white coat this past Sunday. She's uh, finished with her third year of vet school at Ohio State. None of my three girls went into nursing, but I have one who's going to be a vetra veterinarian. So what are you going to do in the next five or 10 years if you know you can't fail to create a better culture of well-being here at this university? So I'm going to let this little girl finish and motivate you to make one healthy lifestyle change for your family and for the people who love you today. Think. This mouse is a little squirrel. Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success. And you're going to wake up and we're going to work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. You should get to a point where anyone else will quit. And you're not going to stop there. No, what are you waiting for? Just do it. Just, just do it. Yes, you can. Just do it. <laughs> I love that. So if, if you're on Twitter, follow me for daily doses of inspiration and motivation at Burn Melnick. Thanks, everybody, and happy Nurses Week again.